They lie and they lie, and in front of the Senate Banking Committee, they lie some more. And every other word out of their mouth, they're reassuring you how safe and sound the banking system is. Oh, no, it is not taxpayers or depositors that are gonna have to pay because the bailout that went to Silicon Valley Bank and also Signature Bank was from the diff fund, except that the Fed borrowed more directly from the treasury than there was even in the diff fund, but now we're hearing that that's only gonna cost 20 billion. I'm telling you, I wish that Pinocchio was real because we would see all their noses growing out and going around the world with their lies. Do you believe them? Because I don't. Let me show you more of how safe and sound this banking system is coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service, thank goodness, physical gold and silver dealer specializing really in those custom strategies that are based upon 100% of history. Because look, do they want you to think this time is different? Sure they do. But is it different? Well, it wasn't different over 4,800 times. We're doing the same thing. Is it going to be different now? I don't think so. And much as they say, no bailout, who is responsible for the balance sheet of the Fed, for the balance sheet of the US government, for the balance sheet of any government agencies? It's the taxpayers. And that money, well, no, only 20 billion is coming out of the diff fund, but 140, I wonder if that's 28 billion in addition to that 148 billion that the Fed borrowed from the treasury and gave to the FDIC to bail out the uninsured depositors. Okay, let's just get started. Because at the same time that all of that was happening, banks borrowed $164.8 billion from the Fed in a rush to backstop liquidity in the zero reserve environment. Remember, I showed you that last week. We have zero reserves and the banks are safe and sound. Then why in the world did they need to borrow almost $165 billion dollars in a backstop liquidity program. That discount window surged to a record 152.85 billion and they created a new facility and that totaled almost 12, 12 billion in just the first three days. So it's garbage. If our system was so safe, sound and secure, what is it safe, sound and secure when they have to borrow this level just to backstop liquidity? It's garbage. Now look at this because this is the discount window borrowing. This is what happened in 2008, that level of borrowing. This is what happened in 2020, a much lower level of borrowing into that crisis. But this is what's happening right now, 2023, far surpasses any level. And how much liquidity did the Fed pump into the system since 2008? And they're trying to reduce their balance sheet? Every time they've tried to do that, it's been a big fat fail. Now, what this really does is it reverses the QT, the tightening there really hasn't been a whole lot of tightening. It's just that the Fed was raising interest rates to reduce that borrowing, but it wasn't working anyway. Can you see this? And have I not been saying to you that we had to have a crisis before June? Okay, if you think that this is done because Credit Suisse was bought out by UBS and you know, all of these banks are being sold to other banks. No, this crisis, we're only seeing this little bit. There is so much more that's underneath the surface, which I've been trying to show you. So because things are so under control, Yellen on Friday calls for an FSOC meeting after the banking sector turmoil because they want to calm 
the markets and depositors concerns. Oh my goodness. Because Yellen actually came out and said that they bailed out the uninsured depositors because they caused a systemic risk, but that they were not going to do a blanket deposit insurance, insuring all deposits. And so with that, really what she was telling us is if you're a small bank, you're not going to get bailed out because we're not, we're not worried about systemic risk, but those venture capitalists, those technology companies, they got bailed out. They were suddenly too big to fail. SVB was suddenly too big to fail, even though, I mean, stress tests, I mean, seriously, what a joke, to be honest with you. The step comes as regulators continue efforts to instill calm in the financial market, because this is a con game. It requires calm. It requires confidence. This is definitely a test of the confidence. Uh, financial markets and among bank depositors following the recent failure of two mid-sized lenders in the U.S. and the near collapse of banking giant Credit Suisse Group AG before its government brokered takeover by rival UBS Group AG. The council discussed current conditions in the banking sister system. This should make you feel so much better. I know it does me. I'm being facetious. I hope you know that. The council discussed current conditions in the banking sector and noted that while some institutions have come under stress, the U.S. banking system remains sound and resilient. Okay, good to know. You see, banks are just fine. We're being told. I think you've got to think of the unintended consequences of taking a public that has more full faith and confidence in the banking system than maybe people in this room do. <laughs> so you see, nothing to worry about. The banking system is fine. Even though mid-sized U.S. banks are asking the FDIC to insure deposits for two years. That's all deposits. Financial system risks more bank runs without this aid, and they've been moving to firms that are seen as too big to fail, which is something that you and I have talked about many times over the years, because the system definitely picks winners and losers. And unfortunately, you and I, in their opinion, are just the right size to fail because we don't come together enough. All of us, the collective us, does not see this. But when we do, when we can come together collectively and say no, we have far more power than they do. And we've just seen this recently in Israel with a turnaround. We've seen it in China with their, uh, you know, turning around with their COVID zero policies. And, you know, we'll see what happens with France. But I mean, we've got some great examples of how when we all come together, that changes things. Then we are too big to push around. And I love that. Too big to push around. It is imperative that we restore confidence among depositors be before another bank fails, avoiding panic and a further crisis. And while the cost of deposit insurance is not insignificant, the likelihood of it being needed, this is much, much smaller should all deposits be temporarily insured. Here's the problem though. Once they put that insurance in place, are they going to be able to take it away? No, because that in itself would then cause bank runs. No, my all my deposits are not insured. So this is a con game. All con games require confidence, but it's also a con consolidation game because we've seen this through every crisis that those that are big get bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the way, the banks that buy the failing banks that are brokered by the governments, well, they get to take and skim off all the good stuff that's left in the banks. And what do they do? They leave the dregs, the garbage with the FDIC. And much as they want to say, no, 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 it's the diff fund. It's not taxpayers that are paying this out. Well, as we're hearing in all of these, uh, in all of these banking committee drills that they're putting the Fed and the bank and the treasury, et cetera, through, 
Yeah, there are different treatment for different levels of depositors, but the reality is, is everybody's going to be paying for it. Nobody is immune to it. And guess what? When grilled, I mean, this was, this was pretty incredible. When grilled about any of these bankers losing their jobs, no, or, or clawing back any of the bonuses, we'll see what happens because if there's enough outrage after what happened in 2008, meaning, you know, nobody that caused this mess went to jail. Nobody got their bonuses or their salaries clawed back. They didn't pay anything for it. They got rewarded for it. Isn't that interesting? And do you really believe that the Fed has your best interest at heart? That the Treasury does? We want to think that they do. But when you pick winners and losers and venture capitalists, last time banks were more important than the public. This time venture capitalists are more important than the public. Technology companies are more important than the public. What is that message that they're really sending? We're picking the winners and the losers. This was too big to fail, so we bailed them out. But don't worry, taxpayers aren't going to do it directly. Well, I don't know if the Fed went to the Treasury to borrow. Is the, aren't the taxpayers responsible for the Treasury's balance sheet too? Just saying. Now, this was created after 2008, that's when they created the Fed stress tests because it really wasn't about, clearly we should be able to see this, how resilient the banking system is. And I've talked about the stress tests over years. This is about instilling confidence in the public. Oh, see, the banks aced the Fed stress tests and that paved the way for massive shareholder payouts. And, you know, large lenders are poised to return 80 billion to investors. And this is what I want you to understand from this. Once that money is paid out from these corporations, it is no longer available should a crisis ensue. Keep that in mind. All firms stayed above the Fed's capital minimums. And guess what? SVB was also above the Fed's capital minimums. Large lenders, as I said, return 80 billion, but banks can announce the payout plans starting Monday. So zip, zip, okay, they ace those Fed stress tests. The problem is, is that the Fed overlooked the risk of rising rapid, rapidly rising interest rates. Wait a minute, who's raising those interest rates? Oh, the Fed. So they didn't even look at rising interest rates. They looked at what would happen in a crisis if they pushed the interest rates to zero. Well, I got news for you. Since we have been almost 15 years, since we have been in a zero interest rate environment, you think that all of the banks that are out there, all the pension funds, all the insurance companies, all of the all of the retirement funds, do you think there's a possibility that they have what is billed as so safe, these treasury bonds? We've been talking about the lack of liquidity since 2015. Do you think it's possible that this kind of garbage is sitting on all of those balance sheets in all of those institutions? And remember, as the Fed raises interest rates, the principal value of those bonds declines. And yet they didn't test for that. Just brilliant. Nearly a year of rapid rate hikes eroded the value of bank portfolios like SBBs. So all banks, all insurance companies, pension plan administration, everybody that's managing your money took those risks and bought out on the spectrum. So yes, you are seeing all, all banks' valuations of their bond holdings have eroded. 
A stress test is only as good as the scenarios that it tests. And they want the banks to pass this because it's about confidence. I mean, they have immediately, they didn't even finish writing all the rules in Dodd-Frank before they began to dismantle it. Hey, we have six years of experience. Everything is hunky-dory. But they have yet to have done what Glass-Steagall did back in 33, which is eliminate that, that interconnection between risk-taking banks and deposit-taking banks. They aren't even talking about that. I've not heard one entity talk about doing that. So that means that as long as they don't change that, that risk is going to remain in the system. So they'll put in new regulations, what, the ones that they just took out? How about the ones that they didn't even finish writing by the time they started to dismantle it? Remember, only 70% had been written. And how much of that 70% had been implemented? No, they just kept postponing and postponing and postponing until all of that became irrelevant. So yeah, a stress test is only as good as the scenarios it tests. This was a basic scenario, the Fed raising interest rates suddenly and sharply, and they were the one that, that has done that. So just keep in mind, didn't the Fed know what the Fed was going to do? And this is who you trust to guide this bus, to put us into CBDCs, where, as they say, they can have their finger on that button and moderate their policies instantly, instantaneously, in real time. Oh, yeah, I feel real safe about that. No, in gold, in silver, I trust. I do not trust those at the top that are dictating who eats the losses at the bottom, which is you and me. And now I wanna take you back to memory lane a little bit because this is a definitely a more true scenario. And what we're looking at here is the deposit insurance fund, those reserve ratios. Now, they say that 1.35% is the statutory level that they think banks should, or the diff fund should hold for failing institutions. And yet, this is the percent of insured deposits. When we look at 2008, the highest level that they had was 1.19%, which means that for every dollar's worth of, of insured deposits, they had a little bit more than a penny. And when the crisis unfolded, so by December of 2008, they had way less than a penny, right? And then it went into negative territory in 2009, and it didn't get much better in 2000 and, uh, 2010. And look, in 2008, we had 25 banks that failed. 2009, we had 140 banks that failed. 2010, we had 157 banks that failed. And the FDIC said, if even one more small bank fails, they will not be able to hide what you are looking at right now. They won't be able to hide it from the public. And let me remind you that the Fed just borrowed $148 billion from the Treasury and loaned it to the FDIC. Now, they, again, you know, you're gonna hear them say, well, we're gonna charge an extra fee to all of the banks to boost this fund. But frankly, I, as I showed you, they haven't really in all these years, they have not even boosted it up to the statutory level. And even that is still a little bit more than a penny for every insured deposit. But don't worry, because the Fed is now backstopping anybody that they think is too big to fail. But who is going to help them bring out those CBDCs? Mm. <gasps> Venture capital groups and tech companies. And they got bailed out. A coincidence that they would be deemed too big to fail? And they knew about it years in advance that there was a problem with it. Yeah. And, and insider trading on the stock. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. 
but it took them until 2011 to even get to some kind of positive level where they had 0. 0.0006, right? So way less than a pen, penny. And in 2011, they had 92 banks that failed. You've got to understand that the FDIC was put in in 33 to gather confidence as was on a global basis, all of that deposit insurance scheme, their words, not mine, but I totally agree, to generate confidence. Because if you lose confidence, you pull your money out, don't you? Yep, you do. Yep, you do. Now, this should really kind of scare you. This goes through the end of 22, and this is from uh, an FDIC report. Remember, all those links you can find on the blog and below. So do yourself a favor, do your own due diligence. These are all FDIC insured institutions, so the big ones as well as the small ones. And you might notice is this was the peak back in 2009. Uh, these, the light blue line is the number of the banks that failed and the black gra lines are assets of the banks that are troubled. These are problem banks, not the banks that failed, but this is the problem bank list. So you can see that it peaked in 2011, as I just showed you, and the problem bank list because of all of this money printing and ZERP, zero interest rate policy, which was what inspired the banks to take on all of this extra debt that is now causing havoc because, I mean, who could have seen that coming? I mean, certainly not the Fed, clearly. Oh my gosh, they're so surprised. But let me show you what bothers me because it was going into 2018 where we had a sudden jump in the assets of problem banks. And then going into 2020, the end of 2021, the fourth quarter, and going into 2022, look at how much that jumped. And a lot of that has to do with the Fed raising rates. So do we really know what the problem is since a lot of this is off balance sheet or it's done on over the counter, which is between two or three entities. I mean, we don't, we have not really seen the ramifications of this yet. And I might remind you that it was in March, almost to the day when JP Morgan took over Bear Stearns and that was supposed to solve the problem. And then when did it become apparent to the public? Hmm, September the following September. So are we gonna have something happen in September or somewhere near that? Because I personally find it really interesting that the number of problem banks have been declining, but the assets of these problem banks is exploding. Yeah, well, if you don't have to do stress tests or even if you do do the stress test, if they aren't testing what's actually happening, which is a Fed policy, but don't worry, because the Fed is going to do an internal audit to see where they went wrong. And oh, by the way, SVB, the president or the CEO, one of those guys, I don't know which one, I don't remember off the top of my head, but he sat on the board at the San Francisco Fed. Do you think he might have influenced anything there? Eh, nothing to see here. Let's see, who else? Do you think, what other bank do you think could have the same level of influence? Because this was also about the lobbying efforts to get rid of requirements. Just keep in mind, bailing out the two failed banks took more than all the money in the diff fund. And you and I, my friend, we are not too big to fail. You need to have some cash that's completely out of the system. And I, I can't tell you if they put ch new chips in, the ones that the currencies, the cash that they're issuing now or not. But if you're getting older bills, then that's cash in the wild. You need a certain level. And our strategy 
you know, our strategy addresses that and it's based upon your current cost of living. That's your first line of defense. Beyond that, you need your gold, you need your silver. You bail yourself out. You make sure that you are fiscally sound. If you're counting on the banks, the Fed, the Treasury, all those guys, if you're counting on them to protect your safety, can you not see the writing on the wall? Their job is to protect the banks, not you. And those that can lobby and throw enough money at their campaigns. I hate it. I wish it wasn't the way, but it is. And what's really interesting coming into this whole piece, this test of this very fragile system is the digital age where users in a speedier move, more viral breed of bank run because boom, they push a button and they can make things happen. They can pull the money out of the system. And this is a really, really interesting component new component that we didn't have in 2008. So are you about to see how the government can control the internet? Because they'd already like to control so social media. And once we've got the CBDCs, I mean, and the smart driving cars and the smart houses, you miss a payment, boom, you're locked out. I mean, please become your own central banker and become as independent and self-sufficient inside of community that you possibly can. And the time to do it is now. If you haven't subscribed yet, you need to, because this is the kind of stuff that you need to know. And you don't need to know after it's too late for you to do anything about it. The online transactions that have streamlined finance in recent years allowed people to react immediately. So I think a lot of people that, especially in the younger generation that are so dependent on the internet and these systems are going to be blindsided when the government steps in and pulls a China. Nope. Nope. We don't want you to know that. We don't want you to do that. I, I think this is uh, going to be shocking for a lot of people but I'm going to be ready. And don't worry because Yellen says the U S is prepared for additional deposit actions if needed. So, okay. So if it's a small little bank that nobody's going to pay attention to, then it's not needed. But if it's a larger bank with entities that they deem important, then it's needed. I mean, really? Cause I don't think that's the way you and I are thinking about it. And guess what? Aren't we systemically important to those that we support and love and take care of? Yeah, I'm thinking so. Aimed at avoiding a repeat of the market volatility when she said Wednesday that treasury officials had neither considered nor examined the possibility of expanding federal insurance temporarily to all us bank deposits without congressional approval. Yeah. They're picking their winners and their losers and they always do. And it should be crystal clear to you that they do. And you, my friend are not a winner, but if we all come together in community, then we are, then we're too big to fail too big to jail, but we are just about the right size to make a difference. And I want to show you something here technically, because this is the spot gold market. And you know, I talk all the time about the physical gold market, but when I have the opportunity to give you a technical lesson, I'm going to do it. So here we see the cup formation, right? It's jagged, but you can see it clearly. And this is an accumulation pattern. Well, we had a breakout back in 2020, right? We broke out. And then they've been holding it down like a spring, right? So what happens is when you hold a spring and you release your hand, that spring is going to shoot in a direction. What we're experiencing right now is most likely to be a triple top. So in reality, this market, even the spot gold market wants to go higher but it's being suppressed and pushed down and pushed down. 
when we get this breakout above this level, that third test might go down again, but when it breaks above that level, you are going to see spot gold shoot like nobody's business, just like it always does. And remember when I get technical, this works for everything. So it doesn't really matter. I'm not just talking about gold, but this is what this chart is telling me. And at the same time that it's also telling me that economic optimism is collapsing. It was at in 2019, 53%. Today, it sits at 40% in just a couple of years. People now fear for their economic future without a trust safety net. Only 40% of respondents say they and their families will be better off in five years, a 10 point decline from 2022. This is not a good thing because this whole Ponzi scheme requires confidence. This is an indication of that loss of confidence. But if we can come together, then we can be a whole lot more confident in our financial future. And if you own gold and silver, as well as food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter, then you can feel very confident in your future, in those that you care about future. And if we can all come together, or at least a nice percentage of people can come together and say, we see what you're doing, oh Fed, oh Treasury, and we say no. How do you say no? Yeah, vote with your purses. That's how you say no while you still have the opportunity. Pretty simple. So if you haven't yet, make sure you watch last week's video on banks and bailouts, because this is critical for you to understand. I'm showing you a little bit below the surface. Truthfully, I can't see all of it, but let me tell you, when I saw that the banks had essentially spent as much to reduce the level of visible uh, derivatives as they have showing you that level scared the crap out of me. So if you haven't seen that yet, go back and watch it. Also, we did launch a new Spanish channel and this takes whatever work I do on Tuesday night and just a few questions less than like, you know, maybe around 10 minutes, maybe a little more, hopefully a little less. So it's something that's digestible in both Spanish and English. Maybe you can share that with people that you can't get to watch the longer videos. And also it's critical for you to be as independent and self-sufficient. So join us on beyond gold and silver on our YouTube channel, on the website so that you can execute that mantra, which is critically, critically important. And if you haven't done it yet, click that Calendly link below, set up a time to meet with one of our gold and silver specialists so that you can put your own strategy in place and make a difference, a positive difference in your future. Keep in mind, your financial shields are made of metal, gold and silver. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.